Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Washington. So just why are Occupy Wall Streeters focusing so much on Wall Street? There's a lot of other big businesses in the United States and around the world, and certainly the people that control those businesses have a lot to do with what's going on in terms of the state of the world, and particularly the divisions between the 99% and the 1%. John Weeks is a professor emeritus at the University of London. He's also the author of the book, Capital, Exploitation, and Economic Crisis. And he joins us now from the Perry Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts. Thanks for joining us, John. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. So in a recent piece you wrote on your website, John, you, you point out that it's not just about excessive banking uh, practices or speculation. It's something far more structural that's at stake. Uh, wh what was your point? A month ago, the Bureau of Economic Analysis of the Department of Commerce announced the typical American's family had a family income had fallen by 1%. Now, what they meant by typical is the family that has an income right in the middle that divides the population 50-50. But what they, I didn't tell you in that article was the average had gone up. Now, think about that for a moment. From 2009-2010, the bottom 50% their incomes went down by 1%. And the top 50% went up. This is in a recession. How could that happen? It's because of that powerful redistributive effect. And that is tied up with the financial sector. And you can see it in the, in the statistics. In 1950, the financial sector of the United States accounted for less than 3% of the national income. Now it's up close to 9%. Public sector wages and salaries, all state governments, all local governments, the federal government, all of them put together, come to 15%. And the financial sector is almost 9%. We aren't far from the day when the government will be smaller than the financial sector. Of course, in terms of power, it's already true. Well, the argument, John, I think you'd get from uh, bankers and, and financiers is that you need this kind of global capital flow to make a globalized economy work, and, and speculation and such is, is a part of what drives the uh, machine. Okay, well, let's look at different countries, at their financial sector, and at their growth performances. One of the best performing countries in terms of growth, let's just look at the de a developed country to begin with, is Germany. But isn't that partly because the Germans depend on the Americans to play that role? Germany, to a great extent, its rapid growth has been the result of mercantilist policies over the last 30 years. Most of its trade is with the European Union, overwhelmingly. It is the only big country in Europe with a trade surplus. Basically, everybody else is Germany's market. It has an enormous trade surplus. Some years, it had, some years in the 2000s, it had larger trade surplus than China. If what you're looking for is economic success, you don't have to go for finance. I wouldn't recommend Germany's either, but you don't have to go to finance. If you stop and think about it, what do financiers do? What do banks do? They don't produce anything. They don't design anything. They don't transport anything. What they do is they allow companies to carry on investments and trade in excess of the cash that companies have. And we would have a much more primitive economy. We would be like the 19th century in the absence of banks, because banks allow a company to make an investment without having to save up for you know, decades to uh, invest in a uh, plant that's going to last uh, 50 years. They can borrow the money, which in effect is redistributing income from companies that are contracting to companies that are expanding. Now, that's an important function, but if you think about it, it's a pretty modest function, and pretty much that's what banks did until 1980. They were regulated, that's what they could do, and they did an all right job of it. And we didn't have banking crises from 1945, 1980 of any significant size. <laughs> we had a, a, a fairly good uh, uh, rate of growth, much higher rate of investment in the United States than we have now. What finance has done, basically, is to discover ways of making money without producing. That's what the deregulation did. Forgive me if I'm uh, wandering around, but I'll try to come back to, uh, and sum it up in a minute. But 
basically what happened, what situation before 1980 is in order to make big money in the United States, you had to produce something. <clears throat> you couldn't speculate. After 1980, increasingly the banks began to be deregulated and that created the scope to accumulate wealth without going through production. And you could do it by speculating on price changes in the future, by dealing with vulnerable low, uh, uh, borrowers, such as the uh, subprime crisis. All those things were not allowed uh, uh, before that. So one of the things you point out in your article is that there is a function, a useful function banks play, which is to take money from sectors of the economy that are accumulating capital and then move them through lending to sectors of the economy that need expansion. But you say in your article that could be done without that being a for-profit exercise. How, what would that look like? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of possibilities, some of which we have, uh, we have experience with. So, for example, in Britain, there were uh, things called building societies, which are similar to savings and loans. But in the building, there were mutual societies. You know, you are a member, you, um, uh, you paid into it, you could borrow out of it. They kept their balance because they were holding mortgages, so people were repaying them and, they were, uh, and money was going out. And the excess money they had, had they would lend for primarily for industrial uh, investments. Now, they were restricted in what they could do and what they could lend, on, uh, lend for because it had to be fairly uh, safe, you know, because people's homes and mortgages and all were tied up, and so it was fairly restricted. But that was, a, and they were limited in, they were not allowed to, uh, uh, to make profits, they were, <laughs> They could, of course, pay their executives, but there was a limit on that. The money had to be returned to the mutual fund holders. You could certainly do that. That's one, uh, one possibility. Another possibility is you could put a cap on the, um, uh, the profits of banks. You can run a bank as uh, rather like uh, charitable foundations, you know, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, such that <coughs> they would engage in these activities, but they would be limited in the uh, income they could uh, generate. John, when you talk to people that are involved in commodities or commodities regulation, they say the problem is excessive speculation, that there is a certain amount of speculation that's actually needed. For example, if a farmer wants to hedge a crop, uh, you know, guarantee a certain price, he needs uh, someone to sort of bet him on the other side of his hedge or you can't hedge, so there needs to be some speculators in the market. They say the problem is excessive speculation. That's what they need to be need, needs to be controlled. So, do you buy this idea that there is a necessary form of speculation, and that is the only way to have a kind of vibrant market? I would say it's dangerous, and there are alternatives. For example, like to take the farmer example. There should be a federal ad administered insurance scheme for farmers. And there has been in the past. It was associated with farm price supports. It doesn't have to be associated with farm price supports. And there are countries where that's true. Why does that have to be in the private market? It seems to me absolutely clear that that is a case where there's no real argument for it being in the private sector. First of all, most farmers are weak. The big conglomerates that run, you know, huge maize uh, estates and uh, cattle farms and so on, they don't have, they aren't, they aren't hedging for the purpose of protecting themselves, they're hedging for a more nefarious purpose. It's a small farmer that's hedging to protect himself, and they're in a very weak position with regard to, uh, to the speculators. When you're, when you're weak, you're weak. S speculation, I would say, makes you weaker. So in the next segment of our interview, John, let's talk about the following paragraph you wrote in your piece. Why are so many people protesting against Wall Street? Because it's become stronger than our democratic state, and if unrestrained, will take us down the dark road to political dictatorship to join the economic tyranny it currently enjoys. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with John Weeks on The Real News Network.